I've used the events, uh, the weather and climate events of the past, of the past 12 months um, to illustrate um, what can happen when both climate variability and climate change um, interact with each other. And we've seen, um, well, we've, we've seen the impacts on that uh, climate. One of the biggest shifts in, in climate, which, which occurred around about May of, of last year, um, a strong shift from, from very dry conditions into, um, in, into wet, um, highly unusual, and again, variability in climate change um, playing, uh, playing their role um, there. And just try to unpack that a little bit, um, and obviously those uh, impacts flown through to, um, uh, to, to agriculture. So thanks very much. Um, so key messages um, fr from here, uh, the first one I've, I've basically said said already, but just quite, quite a fascinating 12, 12 months, a very dry start uh, with, um, uh, with the El Nino operating through uh, 2015 into early 2016. Um, then the very wet uh, winter spring, um, extreme heat returning um, dur during the summer, and what has emerged over the past four or five months is very dry conditions over pockets of eastern, eastern Australia. Um, on the climate change um, side of things, uh, we are seeing um, increases um, in uh, the frequency and intensity of several uh, weather and climate um, extremes. I'll talk a little bit about those. I'll talk about the climate information and tools as well, the, uh, particularly the seasonal, uh, uh, seasonal forecasting uh, uh, products that we, uh, that we put out. Um, and we're seeing improvements in them, but uh, clearly still some way some way to go. And then I'll finish with just some thoughts around uh, the data models and the partnerships to improve outcomes uh, for farmers. So the picture on the left um, is at Birdship um, in uh, October. Uh, so after a very lengthy period of, uh, of dry conditions, uh, the map in the middle are rainfall deciles for April 2016. Uh, the red, obviously, the, uh, the dry conditions and the blue, the above average um, rainfall. Um, so things were very dry across large parts of um, Australia. Um, over a good part of the east, uh, things have been dry for three to four years. Um, and indeed, in southwestern Victoria, um, dry, uh, dry for a uh, relatively lengthy, lengthy period. Um, so we were a bit surprised, I guess, when that outlook uh, showed up on the top right there. Our forecast that was issued in, in April uh, for the May, June, uh, in July uh, period, uh, it's on the, showing the chances of getting above average, uh, above average rainfall. And this, uh, these forecasts come out of our Poama um, climate, uh, climate model, which we've been issuing um, official forecasts for the past, past few years. So this was issued in April during a very dry period. What it was picking up was record warm conditions in the Indian Ocean um, to the, to the northeast, uh, northwest of, uh, of Australia. In fact, conditions, um, uh, warm conditions in the oceans that were unprecedented in the instrumental, instrumental record. Um, so with that, it wasn't altogether surprising that we were gonna see this shift towards uh, wet, wet condi uh, conditions, but this is a pretty bullshy uh, forecast uh, going back during that period. Bottom right is what actually eventuated in terms of, in, in terms of the rainfall. Um, so the same period, May to July, uh, but what was actually observed, and again, again the, blue, um, the blue above average rainfall, the very blue, very much above, um, ab ab above average. And you're probably thinking, well, Neil wouldn't have shown this if it had been a bad forecast, and you're exactly right, I wouldn't have shown it at, at all. <laughs> I'll just leave that one there. Another one, so, so we wind forward to September, uh, September 20 uh, of la last year. Um, Top right uh, was our forecast um, issued in uh, May uh, for the June to August uh, period, and the observation is in the middle bay. Um, so again, a very, uh, very good forecast. And in fact, that period, the period from May through to September was Australia's wettest period on record, with records going back to, uh, to 2010. And, um, and I guess quite unusual to see an outlook, a forecast there, quite emphatic in terms of how, how above average um, conditions were likely to be. So again, would I have shown this if it had been about? Well, probably not, but anyway. Um, forward a little bit further, so into early um, 20, 2017, uh, February, 
uh, we had this, um, this extraordinary heat wave um, over southeastern Australia. Um, all, sort of, all, all sorts of records broken. Um, some of those are described on the right-hand side there. Um, ended up New South Wales had their record, record warmest uh, summer, uh, with records going back to uh, 2010. This map um, shows uh, the highest temperatures that were recorded around Australia during that first two weeks of, of, of February. And that brown, that brown area um, is an area of above 45, uh, 45 degrees. So just about all the locations in there got above 45 degrees at some point. So quite an extraordinary, um, extraordinary event. Reasonably well forecast. This is an experimental uh, product uh, looking at severe, uh, severe heat wave uh, conditions where um, by late January we're getting a suggestion that February was going to be um, was going to be quite hot. Quite unusual here. If we go back 12 months when we had a, um, a relatively strong El Nino operating, and we know with El Nino, Southern Australia generally get warmer, uh, warmer conditions. That El Nino had, um, had weakened by, uh, by April, May of last year. We weren't in El Nino uh, territory, but we're still getting these extraordinary temperatures um, over southern and eastern, eastern Australia. Um, and that's when, the, uh, that's when the climate change element comes in as, a, as an explainer. Um, back in October, uh, the CSIRO and ourselves put out this state of the climate uh, document. We do so every, every, every two, two years. One of the graphics in there is uh, this one, uh, which is a measure of the frequency, uh, frequency and spatial extent um, of, um, of heat, heat events. And very clearly, we've, uh, we've seen an increase um, almost decade on decade in, the, um, in those sort of, of events. I won't go into how this is computed, but happy to um, talk, talk about that, that later. Um, so much more. Um, far more frequent events during the latter part of this uh, period. What I find most interesting of this graphic is not is what's not actually on the graphic. Is um, what will the next few decades look like ahead if this trend uh, continues? And um, uh, the climate models do suggest that um, these trends will continue, and we will experience um, hotter um, hotter days going uh, go going forward. There's other changes um, to, the, to the climate system. Uh, the temperature one is the one that's clearest in terms of the trends. It's clearest in terms of the, the projections too. Um, uh, there's a bit more uncertainty uh, with, the, uh, with, with the rainfall uh, uh, projections. What we've seen in the observations that's very clear is a drying over uh, southern Australia. So particularly in southwestern Australia since around about 1970, uh, we've had a a 19% decline in, in rainfall compared to the long-term average there. Um, from the mid-1990s in the southeastern Australia, we've had a decline of about 11% um, since, uh, since the mid-1990s compared to the long-term average. Uh, so very clear signals um, in, in uh, rainfall in the south, less clear in the north, although summer rainfall has increased over a good part of the north and western Australia um, over, that, um, o over that period. So what's driving that? Um, it is when you look at other observations of atmospheric circulation, mean sea level pressure, and so forth, there has been more intense subtropical ridge um, measured over southern Aus Australia. So that's basically the belt of high pressure uh, systems. They've uh, become more intense. As a result of that, the frontal systems and low pressure systems have been pushed further south um, over the past few decades than what there were earlier in the period, so we've had less uh, rainfall during that, uh, that cool, uh, cool season, um, April to, uh, to, to October. And that's how it looks at the top right there in, in, um, in, in the time series. Um, so you'll see very clearly um, since, um, since around about 1990, just in, in southeastern Australia, uh, the drop-off in, um, in the wet years uh, compared to earlier in the period. But interestingly, you'll see we can still get, we can still get wet years uh, there. So 2016 uh, was wet, and it was wet because the climate variability influence was so strong. Those record warm Indian Ocean temperatures just to the northwest of Australia I spoke about earlier. Um, so they were sufficiently large that, um, 
that difference in temperatures from the western Indian Ocean, tropical Indian Ocean to the, to the eastern was sufficient to really drive, um, drive wetter conditions uh, over the southeast there. So less rainfall here, um, and, and, and that's particularly relevant by, by my two, um, two colleagues who'll be talking after me. Uh, we'll unpack that a little bit further in terms of agricultural impacts, but the rainfall must be falling somewhere, um, and it is. So this is a location at 55 degrees um, south, um, so well, uh, well south of, um, of, of the continent, Macquarie Island, um, and as the uh, as the observations, the models suggest, um, increased rainfall further south with those um, frontal systems and lows being pushed further, um, f further south, um, and, and that shows there. So an explanation um, with, with that, and it's not absolutely conclusive, but when we run global climate models with increased greenhouse gases, with natural variability, with reduced stratospheric ozone, um, it shows similar reductions in southern Australian rainfall as what we're seeing here. Another graphic in State of the Climate uh, was this one, um, shown um, just depicting there what the future climate uh, of Australia will look like. I won't spend a lot of time on this. The bottom left, um, temperatures will, will increase with more hot days and fewer cool days. On the right-hand side, extreme rainfall events likely to be more intense as the decades go on. Harsher fire weather uh, projected for southern and eastern Australia. Uh, and what I just spoke about before with the winter and spring rainfall um, in the decades ahead, seeing further decreases um, there. Now, other developments uh, we've had in, in the Bureau, and, um, and very much thanks um, to uh, funding that came through from the Agricultural Competitive uh, White Paper. Um, so this is work we're doing in partnership with the Department of Agriculture uh, and Water, water resources about how can we improve our, um, our seasonal forecast. As I showed earlier, um, there, are, there are times when uh, the seasonal forecasts are very skillful. Uh, there won't always be, it'll, it'll largely depend on what those, what those, drivers, um, uh, those drivers are shown. But we know there's a lot of potential to improve these forecasts um, further. Um, where we've got to so far with the, the POAMA uh, cl climate model, um, we've had a lot of support from the Managing Climate Variability uh, Program and the RDCs that are associated with that program. And I don't think we would have got anywhere close to where we've got to uh, without that support. So agriculture has been a very strong backer um, of the science and the models and the services with seasonal forecasting. Um, but this latest um, initiative is hopefully going to pu push us um, um, even further, improving resolution. Uh, the model we use now only has a resolution of 250 kilometres. We'll go to 60 kilometres and then push it further to, um, to around about 5 uh, kilometres. Um, we're expecting more accurate uh, forecasts uh, as a result of this, uh, th th this model. Um, instead of just issuing forecasts for the next month and the next season, we'll look at the next two weeks the fortnight after that. So we're getting closer to bridging this gap between the traditional weather forecast and what we've termed the seasonal uh, forecast. Instead of just relying on issues every month, um, we'll be able to issue um, updated forecasts um, every two weeks and then possibly every, uh, every week. And rather just rainfall, temperature, and a few other things, we'll look at things like evaporation, humidity, because that's what the model actually, actually generates. Um, so we're really excited about this development um, and what it, can, what it can do for for agriculture. Just to illustrate what the difference in resolution uh, looks like, on the left-hand side is where we are now with Poama, 250 kilometres. Um, we'll get to 60 kilometres uh, later this year uh, with the in introduction of, um, of this new model called Access S. And then that's what five kilometre looks like. Um, so in terms of, um, in terms of uh, the accuracy, the richer, uh, the richer data sources that will be available from, fr from here, um, there, has to be, um, there has to be a concerted effort uh, towards interfacing these data with decision support models in agriculture um, and across other sectors, uh, sectors too, um, but, it's, um, but, but things are looking very, very, very promising. And this, this came up just about a week ago, so almost the first run we've had of the, of, of the new model and um, 
and this is the, um, so on the left hand side, the top left is the new model, uh, the Access S. Um, it's, it's basically the model developed um, in the United Kingdom uh, Met Office, imported and then tweaked slightly uh, for Australian conditions, but we'll do, be doing a lot more tweaking of that as we, as we go forward. That was the forecast, um, the forecast of the chances of exceeding average maximum temperatures uh, for February. And I've already talked about the, uh, the heat event in early February. So the left-hand side suggesting uh, very strong chances of hot conditions over the, uh, over the east and um, high chances of cooler conditions o o over, the, over the west. Uh, the graphic in the, in, in the bottom is, um, is, is the existing model, uh, uh, Puama, which also uh, captured, um, ca captured the heat conditions uh, uh, very well. Uh, but the new model did it better, and it did it better not just in terms of the spatial forecast, but in terms of how emphatic, how confident it was in those, um, in, in, in those extremes. So that's encouraging. That's um, on the top right there is what actually eventuated um, uh, for February. And again, I wouldn't have shown this if it had been a bad forecast, but you, <laughs> you know that already. Um, the rainfall uh, forecast, even better in... Um, in many respects, because rainfall is harder to um, harder predict. Um, the same deal. Uh, the top left there, um, from a um, in experimental mode, the new uh, the new model, um, predicting wet conditions for February over the west and dry or over the or over the east. Um, existing model at the bottom and what was observed in the in the top right. So this is really really encouraging for us to see. There's almost the first uh, the first model runs. Um, uh, we're, we're, we've um, we've un unpacked. Uh, Tasmania is really really interesting because the existing model at the bottom there, uh, given the 250 kilometres, it doesn't resolve Tasmania very well at, at, at all. The new model um, uh, does. The new model was going for dry. We got dry. The old model was slightly going towards uh, wetter uh, wetter conditions. You can drill down to other areas to see uh, see where other improvements are. Future opportunities, so final, uh, fi fi final slide. Um, we're gonna keep going with this, you know, the integration of better science, better models, um, be be better, uh, better technology, it's fantastic that we're getting support from agriculture uh, to do this. Um, I've largely shown products that are, that are looking at uh, the likelihood of above average, below average of certain parameters. We wanna drill down to extreme events. The, um, the real extremes are important. Uh, for agriculture. Um, couple the outputs here to decision support um, systems, make it easier for people to access um, the data and input those data um, into their de decision support um, systems. Engage more closely uh, with the agricultural uh, communities, but most importantly, um, listen. And listen to what those user needs and then tailor this sort of information uh, towards them. Just before I finish, I'm going to show a quick uh, video, um, which actually gets shown on la landline um, once a month. But I'm always at these things. I, I often, often get a question is, um, well, what's the outlook going to be for the next three months? And I actually forgot to do my research on one occasion. I was <laughs> very much embarrassed by it. So I actually take, a, I take um, no risk at all with that now. And I'm going to leave it up to Robin Jewell um, to tell you what the outlook's going to be. Welcome to the Climate and Water Outlook for Autumn 2017. Summer has seen record-breaking heat in eastern Australia, but also record-breaking rainfall in the north and southwest. Above average temperatures are likely to continue into autumn, and the start of the southern cropping season is likely to be drier than average. But first, let's look at recent conditions. Tropical lows and monsoon bursts have brought widespread rainfall and floods to western and central Australia. Southwest Western Australia had its second wettest February on record, with most of that rain falling in the first two weeks. While parts of southern WA have had a cool start to the year, eastern Australia was very hot, particularly in New South Wales and southern Queensland. Moree and Mungindi have had more than 50 days in a row above 35 degrees. The second week of February saw eastern Australia's most severe heat wave since 2009. On the 11th, the average temperature across all of New South Wales was 44 degrees. Even coastal towns didn't escape the extreme heat. 
Fire danger levels during the heat wave were highest on record in some parts of New South Wales, with several severe bushfires affecting the state. Soil moisture has been above average in areas receiving tropical summer rains. However, in southeast Queensland and northeast New South Wales, there's been little rain since September. Combined with very high temperatures, soils have rapidly become drier than average in these regions. Low rainfall and high temperatures in the eastern states have led to a recent drop in water storages, but they are still far higher than at this time last year. So what's driving Australia's climate right now? In recent weeks, the central and eastern tropical Pacific Ocean has warmed, and climate models suggest this warming is likely to continue during autumn. This is in contrast to this time last year, when the Pacific was starting to cool. Although it's early days, we can almost certainly rule out a La Nina for 2017. While our Enzo dial is at inactive, we'll be watching the Pacific Ocean and climate models closely for any further warming. The rainfall outlook for March to May indicates below average rainfall is likely over much of Australia. Several international models we survey also show dry outlooks. Outlook accuracy is moderate at this time of year. What does this mean for the 2017 autumn break? Early indications are that these rains could be late. Turning to the stream flow forecast for February to April 2017. Median to high stream flows are most likely at 98 locations. Low flows are likely at 28 locations, mainly in southern Australia. Accuracy for our stream flow forecast is moderate to high at this time of year. In terms of temperatures, days and nights are likely to be cooler than average in parts of the far north, but warmer than average over the rest of Australia. Further heat waves are possible. Outlook accuracy is low to moderate at this time of year. So in summary, rainfall is likely to be below average for much of Australia. Near median to high stream flows are likely in most places. Temperatures are expected to be warmer than average, and heatwave and bushfire risks are raised in many areas. For more details, go to our website at bomb.gov.au forward slash climate forward slash ahead. You can also get updates via Facebook and Twitter. Our next video will be released on Thursday the 30th of March. For the Bureau of Meteorology, I'm Robin Jewell. Thanks Robin.